Hi, and welcome back to our final keynote presentation for the conference, which will be introduced by Genevieve Donnelly, our Executive Director of Aged Care Policy and Communications. Uh, Genevieve is an experienced clinician with experience, uh, extensive experience across the health and aged care sectors, uh, with a wealth of knowledge in private, not-for-profit and government roles. Genevieve has delivered large-scale national programs with a focus on quality improvement and digital transformation. She was previously the manager of healthcare quality outcomes at iCare, and prior to that, she was at Opal Aged Care, Australian Digital Health Agency, and the Commission for Safety and Quality in Healthcare. She's a pharmacist by training and also has an EMBA, so you can see why she's such a great hire as our new executive director. Um, throughout her career, Genevieve has been instrumental in the development and implementation of clinical and data governance frameworks building organisational capability in the use of data to drive patient outcomes. Over to you, Genevieve. Thank you, James. Well, good morning, everyone. We hope you're enjoying the conference so far. As James said, I'm Genevieve Donnelly, an Executive Director of Aged Care Policy and Communications. Great pleasure to introduce the next plenary session, Measuring Frailty to Capture Patient Complexity, presented by Professor Ruth Hubbard. Professor Ruth Hubbard is a consultant geriatrician at Princess Alexandra Hospital in Queensland. And in our he was appointed the Masonic Chair in Geriatric Medicine at the University of Queensland. She has published widely on the inflammatory etiology of frailty, the difficulties of measuring frailty in clinical practice, and the relationship and obesity, smoking, socioeconomic status, and exercise. Based on the impact of her publications, Professor Hubbard currently ranked number three on the list of frailty experts worldwide. As a passionate advocate for her discipline, Professor Hubbard is promoting academic geriatrics among advanced trainees, medical students and allied health colleagues. She's currently supervising five undertaking PhDs, as well as numerous student projects. More than $9.3 million in grant income in the last five years alone, including as chief investigator on two National Health and Medical Research Council project grants. We hope you enjoy her presentation today and we certainly encourage you to um, add questions to the Q&A bar as we go through the presentation. Thank you, Professor Hubbard. Well, thank you so much for the opportunity to speak to you today about frailty in older inpatients. The title of my presentation is Measuring Frailty to Capture Patient Complexity. I would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands on which we meet today. I pay my respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country. I recognise their valuable contributions to Australian and global society. I have no disclosures or conflicts of interests. My objectives for the next sort of 30 minutes or so are to review the concept of frailty and to consider how frailty has been measured in community dwellers before considering how those measures have been translated to the hospital setting. But to understand frailty, we really need to understand ageing. And the context for this is that as people get older, they are more likely to die. Now, this is all you needed to say to be published in Nature in 1825. So this is Gompert's famous um, law, which it relates the risk of mortality to chronological age. And you can see there the very exponential increase after the age of 50 years. But aging is associated with many other changes, not just the increased risk of mortality. So here we have Usain Bolt, who holds the world record for the fastest 100 meters. And his world record is 9.58 seconds. And here we have the world record holder for a fastest 100 meters for centenarians. Um, and you can see that this gentleman's record was 42.22 seconds. And he tells a very sweet story after this race that he, he started weeping while he was running because he was going so slowly. And if you look at world records for events such as this, even in elite athletes, there is an incremental increase in the time taken to run 100 meters, for example, after the age of 35. Indeed, after the age of 35, 
65, um, you're considered to be a veteran athlete or a geriatric athlete, um, which is why the achievements of Tom Brady in the Super Bowl last year were so extraordinary at the age of 42 years. So aging is associated with an increased risk of disease and disability. Um, so the number of um, comorbidities that somebody has tends to increase with chronological age. And it's important that old age is also associated with disorders with the sensorium, so problems with vision and hearing. Um, as a geriatrician, we divide our patients into three kind of age categories. So those who are age 65 to 75, we consider to be young old. 75 to 85 is old old. And over the age of 85, we consider to be the oldest old. And by the time you reach that age, it is very unusual to have no disorders at all. And frailty is important because it enables us to understand differences in health status between people at the same chronological age. So I've used the Queen as an example here, but interestingly, she has become more frail in the last 18 months. But when she was 95, she was still able to ride a horse, which is quite extraordinary because that requires high levels of coordination, flexibility, agility, muscle strength, um, the integration of visual stimuli, cognitive um, control, whereas many 95 year olds have started to develop deficits in some of those domains. So frailty, as I mentioned, is intended to capture the variability of aging. It's defined as a state of increased vulnerability to stressors. So frailty is indicative of reduced system redundancy. It's a cumulative effect arising from multi-system deterioration, which occurs with the passage of time. A frail individual has reduced physiological reserve, resulting in a reduced ability to maintain homeostasis when faced with a stressor. Now, frailty is related to comorbidity, but not synonymous with comorbidity. And to understand this, we need to think about mechanisms. So frailty doesn't have a linear deterministic pathway. It's the example of a stochastic um, presentation, which occurs as the result of uh, possibly genetic predisposition in combination with lifestyle factors and the environment in which somebody lives. So st large studies have been undertaken now, including twin studies, twin databases, and it's thought that the inheritability of frailty is between 15 and 45 percent. So more than half of your risk of frailty is attributable to your lifestyle and the environment in which you live. And those similar, that similar combination of factors also can lead to some comorbidities um, and comorbidities themselves can result in frailty. And this is why there is such an intricate relationship between those two concepts. Now, this is a very well known um, conceptualization of frailty. Um, and this is a figure that I actually draw on the whiteboard when I'm having discussions with patients and their families during their stay in hospital. So if we think that um, functional ability is reflected here along the um, y axis, and we would all be represented by the green line. So we have high levels of functional independence. And if we were to have have a minor illness, um, our functional status, status would deteriorate slightly, uh, but then bounce back to what it was at baseline. Whereas a frailer individual who, who may have lower levels of functional capacity um, will be hit much harder by that minor insult. So even something like a urinary tract infection can trigger a significant deterioration in functional status. And these patients take a lot longer to recover. Um, and this is where I'm usually having the conversations with patients um, about their rehabilitation journey and explaining that they may not get back over the threshold to enable them to live independently. 
And frailty is associated with an age adjusted increase of all the geriatric syndromes, um, five times the, the risk of going into a nursing home and at least double the risk of mortality. So, as I alluded to, frailty is associated with multiple adverse outcomes. And if we conceptualize the frail older person as being a complex system on the threshold of failure, um, we can understand some of these geriatric syndromes that may arise. So, this is a principle that we have garnered from mechanical systems. So, when mechanical systems fail, they fail with um, elements of the system that require a lot of coordination between different parts of the system. Um, and in the human body, the human system, if you like, um, the most complex functions that we have are upright bipedal ambulation and divided thinking. So if you reflect upon upright bipedal ambulation, this requires muscle strength, coordination, um, the integration of haptic stimuli and um, visual stimuli and judgment and planning and executive function and sometimes dual tasking. And if all those functions are compromised, then a frail older person is vulnerable to presenting with falls. And similarly, divided thinking, so the ability for our attention to switch between one thing and another, if that is compromised, patients will come into hospital with delirium. Um, frailty is also associated with significantly increased risk of pressure injuries, new urinary incontinence and functional decline. So how can frailty be measured? I've put up a quick table there. I'm not expecting you to memorize that, but um, this is just to show that there are multiple domains that are included in many frailty measures. There are lots and lots of frailty measures out there, and they include different, different domains, a different combination of domains. Um, so we will talk in more detail about the freed phenotype um, and the clinical frailty scale and the frailty index, but there are many other measures that have been devised. They tend to include aspects of disability, um, mobility impairment, physical function, cognition, mood, uh, whether a patient has good social support or not, nutritional status, comorbidities, medication burden, um, self-rated health. There's a, just one, the Vulnerable Elder Survey includes um, a couple of marks if you're over the age of 85, but most frailty measures don't include chronological age because they're trying to tease out differences in health status between people of the same chronological age. So the freed phenotype I mentioned is the most well-known and widely used phenotypic measure of frailty. It was first described in 2001 by Linda Freed's group in the United States, and it was um, derived from the cardiovascular health study. And it says that somebody is frail if they have three or more of these five criteria, which are unintentional weight loss, self-reported exhaustion, weak grip strength, slow walking speed, and low levels of physical activity. So this has been widely validated in many community dwelling populations. It's quick to administer and requires minimal equipment and training. The disadvantages of the freed phenotype are that it categorizes people into two or at most three different groups um, being frail, um, pre-frail and fit. Um, and it doesn't include any measures relating to mood or cognition. So the clinical frailty scale is a another categorical approach to frailty, but in this case, um, classifying people into nine different groups, ranging from very fit, being clinical frailty scale of one, to terminally ill. And this, it, it, the, the questions to um, place somebody in one of these categories actually embrace many different domains, including activities of daily living, um, management of medication, endurance, 
um, whether somebody can cope with instrumental ADLs as well as personal ADLs. Um, so there's quite a lot of information that needs to be uh, garnered to accurately complete a clinical frailty scale. And this has been validated against probability of survival um, and discharge to a nursing home. But the approach to frailty that I have been advocating and um, investigating here in Brisbane is the deficit accumulation approach. So in this uh, uh, conceptualization of frailty, it can be considered to be a multidimensional risk state, which can be measured by the number rather than the nature of health problems. So various disorders are accumulated by individuals during their lives, and the more deficits that are accumulated, the more likely that person is to be frail. So this approach to frailty was conceptualized by Ken Rockwood, who is a geriatrician based in Dalhousie University in Halifax in um, Canada, and his colleague Arnold Mitnitsky, who was a, a mathematician who died last year. Um, deficits can be symptoms, signs, disabilities, abnormal laboratory measurements, but they need to fulfill um, each of these five criteria. So they need to accumulate with chronological age and they need to be associated with an adverse outcome. Um, they also need to not saturate, which means they mustn't happen to everybody at a particular chronological age. Um, and the example we normally give for that is presbyopia. So needing to wear spectacles to read is pretty ubiquitous by the time of 55 years of age. Um, you need to cross different domains. So we normally count some measures of functional status, um, count comorbidities, difficulties with cognition and mood, um, sensorium, and it's quite easy to get to more than 30 deficits, which is the minimum number of deficits that are needed to derive a frailty index. If you're following the same people longitudinally, you need to include the same items. But the beauty of the frailty index is that if you're using different data sets, you don't need to have the same data points as long as you fulfill those four preceding criteria. So the frailty index is calculated by working out what your denominator is and dividing the number of deficits that somebody has by that number. So if you included 40 deficits in your index and somebody had 10, their frailty index would be 0.25. So you can see how this would be a very granular approach to frailty and would put somebody on a spectrum of health from the most fit people with no deficits at all to those who have the, the most deficits. So frailty indices have been um, calculated now in millions of people in the community. So the Canadian National Population Health Survey um, recruited nearly 15,000 patients from the age of 15 to 102. So it has been validated across the adult life course. And in the UK biobank participants, you know, there are over half a million um, people who have a frailty index derived from, from that data set. Um, Andy Clegg, who is a, a colleague working in Bradford in the United Kingdom, um, described how to derive a frailty index from data that GPs were collecting as part of their routine health checks. And that is now underpinning major trials of personalized care planning to improve outcomes. So if we move now from the measurement of frailty in community dwellers, which is where many of these um, instruments were derived, to reflect on whether they have been explored in inpatients. There is a strong rationale for investigating frailty among inpatients. So at the level of the health system, um, measurements of frailty could underpin appropriate infrastructure and guide the allocation of staff and resources to meet care needs. It could inform differences in outcomes between patients with the same diagnoses. And at the level of the individual patient, um, a measure of frailty could prime less experienced clinicians to prevent, 
to recognize and to manage geriatric syndromes. It could also identify patients with increased vulnerability to adverse treatment effects and slower recovery times. It could guide treatment decisions and multidisciplinary care in hospital and optimize transitions of care and follow-up planning. So there have been many different measures used for inpatients. Um, I supervised Stella Lynn's um, Phil thesis a couple of years ago. She's now a geriatrician working at the Royal Brisbane Hospital. And when she investigated the literature a few years ago, she found that there were 110 studies published um, that were, were purporting to uh, report frailty in surgical patients, and they used 37 different measurement tools. And uh, Olga Theo, who is a research fellow working with Ken Rockwood, um, looked at the papers which were describing frailty in older medical patients. And in two thirds of the papers, there was actually no instrument at all used. Um, and of the remaining third, there were 48 different instruments applied. Um, so if we go back to the measures of frailty that we um, dissected for community dwellers, um, we can start with the freed phenotype. And this has been validated in inpatient populations, uh, but it relies on, on performance based tests. So it really doesn't have great utility for inpatient um, populations who may be acutely unwell. And the, the measures um, of gait speed, for example, um, might not be feasible for somebody who is uh, acutely medically or surgically unwell. And the, any measures that were um, recorded at that stage would reflect the patient's acute status rather than their baseline vulnerability. So the clinical frailty scale is being widely adopted by healthcare systems. So in the NHS, for example, the um, CFS was used to underpin decision making about patients who might be suitable for intensive care during the COVID crisis. And um, the clinical frailty scale also underpins the Queensland Health's Frail Older Persons Collaborative and is being used in um, emergency departments. So there are multiple studies confirming the predictive validity of the clinical frailty scale. So it does identify patients who are more likely to die or to go to nursing homes. Um, one meta-analysis of the clinical frailty scale in emergency departments published just last month found that there were 17 studies identified which enrolled more than 45,000 participants and a clinical frailty scale of five or more had um, reasonable diagnostic accuracy in relation to mortality. Um, a prospective study that I was involved in of um, uh, patients, a, a large number of patients across intensive care units in Australia and New Zealand um, found that about 40% of participants had a, um, a clinical frailty scale of five or more, and their in-hospital mortality was significantly higher. Um, but it was pointed out in the editorial that even those frailer older people, um, and these are you know, patients over the age of 80, um, more than four out of five of them did not die in hospital. So this is some work I had a, a big grant to look at a couple of years ago to derive a frailty index from the interi assessment tool. Um, so this is an instrument uh, used in some localities um, for to underpin a comprehensive assessment of older people. And we found that um, a frailty index of more than 0.4 had really quite good uh, ability to discriminate people who were more likely to have multiple adverse outcomes. So it wasn't quite so sensitive um, to pick up delirium. And uh, that's because um, delirium can occur in anybody who has a very severe um, medical illness. Um, but the positive predictive value and negative predictive value, well, particularly the negative predictive value was, was really quite, um, quite high uh, at this cutoff of the frailty index. 
So electronic frailty indices are being investigated um, in many countries, but the ones that I am most familiar with are being done in Australia. Um, so Sarah Hilmer's group in, in New South Wales have derived a frailty index, which is a combination of prospective data, usually collected by members of the allied health team and retrospective data being the ICD-10 codes. And it has reasonable correlation with other frailty measures and is associated with um, multiple adverse outcomes with an adjusted odds ratio of nearly three um, for inpatient mortality with a cutoff of 0.25. So the hospital frailty risk score is a measurement instrument I'm sure many of you will be familiar with. It was first described by Simon Conroy's group. Um, Gilbert was the first author in a paper published in The Lancet in 2018. It was developed and validated in acute care settings in England um, using uh, it was validated in over a million patients over the age of 75 years and it uses routinely collected health data and uh, patients with the it divides patients into into three categories high intermediate and low and patients with the highest hospital frailty risk score have a significantly higher 30-day mortality um, long hospital stay and 30-day um, readmission the hospital frailty risk score has subsequently been validated in data sets comprising more than 14 million people across developed countries in North America and Europe. However, some studies have questions, it questioned its utility. Um, so an Australian study actually led by Harvey published in Age and Aging in 2020 uh, was a five year retrospective analysis of nearly half a million participants. And there was little difference between the hospital frailty frailty risk score and a comorbidity index in the um, prediction of mortality. I've underlined prediction there because really when we take a retrospective look at these data sets, it's really associations that we're looking at, but the papers always claim to be um, predicting outcomes. And then a patient that uh, a paper rather um, that I wrote the accompanying editorial for in Age and Aging this year um, it, it looked at about a million patients in France, and they were able to follow patients who had multiple hospital admissions. And the hospital frailty risk score was originally advocated as having the potential to inform subsequent admissions in order to optimize and individualize care. Um, so to use data collected during a previous admission to highlight patients who were, were frail and were more likely to have poorer outcomes subsequently. But the important finding from this paper was that restricting the score to data prior to the index admission reduced the discriminative ability of the HFRS substantially. So if we um, do a quick case study of a 76 year old man, this may be um, somebody who, who presents to hospital with a, a, um, sepsis, um, he, but if his baseline status is independent, um, I mean, he may have one or two minor um, medical comorbidities, but if you picture that this gentleman is independent with all his instrumental activities of daily living, he's still driving, um, he works part time and looks after his grandchildren, but if he becomes acutely unwell with bacteremia secondary to a UTI, he may then develop multiple medical complications of that insult with hypovolemia, hypotension, electrolyte disturbance, disturbance and acute renal failure. Um, so according to the, the freed phenotype, if we were to try and do his um, performance-based tests when he comes into hospital, he will be frail. Um, according to the clinical frailty scale, uh, which, which it categorizes people according to their baseline status, he would not be frail. Um, his electronic frailty index would show a, a significant difference between baseline functional status and current abilities. And he scores as intermediate on the hospital frailty risk score because of some of those medical complications. 
So an ideal frailty measure would require minimal clinician and patient effort. It would reflect underlying vulnerability. So ideally picking up um, X here on our figure, um, I mean, ideally picking up X and Y so that we can understand differences in patients' functional status. Um, it needs to be able to be done prospectively to inform patient care and should be valid for all adult inpatients, should be applicable across different care settings and used by the multidisciplinary team and all our um, specialist um, medical and surgical colleagues. So uh, just finally to reflect on some of the instruments that are currently in use. See, the frailty phenotype um, wasn't designed but has been validated for hospital inpatients. It does place a, a significant burden on clinicians and patients because of its reliance on performance-based tests. Um, the clinical frailty scale um, also has been validated and may be available in real time to guide care. The frailty index, um, the original uh, sort of paper-based versions of the frailty index may be considered burdensome, but if if we are utilizing data that's collected for other purposes, um, my feeling is that electronic medical records have huge potential to derive prospective frailty indices to inform patient care. And the hospital frailty risk score, even though it was designed and validated for the inpatient population, is not looking like it has the potential to inform care prospectively. So my remit um, today was to review the concept of frailty and the take home message about that is that it's a loss of physiological reserve, which is closely linked to chronological aging. Um, it can be measured in multiple different ways um, and frailty measurement does have the potential in hospital settings to individualize care to improve patient outcomes. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Hubbard, for such a wonderful presentation. We have a few questions from the audience now that we would like to go through if that's all right. Of course. So the first one we have, and I don't know whether this is a will or should, but will frailty index be incorporated into the DRG classification? So I think that there are many geriatricians who hope that it will um, ultimately and um, not just a, a, a dichotomous diagnosis of frailty, yes, no, but the frailty index has the potential to tell us how frail somebody is on a spectrum of health. Um, which, uh, you know, I really think we need to try to be more sophisticated in our understanding of risk status for these vulnerable individuals, because there are some patients who may be, you know, too frail to benefit from a from a bypass graft, but but not frail enough to um, to, to not reap benefits from multidisciplinary rehabilitation or, or minor interventions like like cataract surgery. So we really need to think where somebody is along that spectrum in relation to the proposed insult or the interventions that um, we may be considering for them. Wonderful, thank you. Another popular question was, what are the benefits in relation to patient outcome of measuring frailty? And what are some of the examples of practical applications for health professionals? Yes. So I think we're at that tipping point at the moment in the frailty um, field where we've done an awful lot of measurement and we know that frail older people are a lot more vulnerable to adverse outcomes and now we need to um, to, to move towards what to do about it and we know that um, frail older people benefit from optimization of medication, for example, um, older people are a lot more likely, for older people who are frail are more likely to have adverse events from inappropriate medication. And so that this is one area where pharmacists are, are starting to be triggered by um, patients' frailty status to alert them to people who are more likely to need and to benefit from um, pharmacy reviews. Um, but we, the, the, you know, the, the, the principles of 
good rehabilitation for older people, um, you know, should be targeted towards those who, who, are, who are more frail. Um, so there isn't a, a strong evidence base yet about, about that, but it's something that we will definitely be accumulating in the next few years. Well, that leads on quite nicely to one of the other questions we had around the impact of medications on frailty index. Yes. Um, so, as I uh, alluded to in the previous answer, um, there are some very elegant studies relating adverse effects of medication and um, potentially inappropriate medication and how that's tolerated by older people in relation to the to their frailty status. So there tends to be, there's been a big movement in the last few years about de-prescribing for older people and some of the um, outcomes of those studies have been conflicting. Um, and it may be because we need to take frailty status into account in terms of whether patients should be on multiple medications um, to prevent further um, problems with their health or whether the, the, the balance is that they should be on fewer medications to prevent side effects. Um, so I think it, having a very robust and precise um, frailty measure could help us understand um, the, the risks and benefits of medication prescribing. Wonderful. And um, one last question, um, and I think this might be from one of the younger members of our audience who's keen to maybe turn this around the other way and look at how we can potentially measure the potential of a younger person to where they might be later on on that frailty scale and how we then use it as a preventative opportunity as opposed to um, maybe impacting on the type of care in the moment in that acute setting. Yes. Yes, well, we certainly know now from, from longitudinal studies what risk factors there are for developing frailty, and that may be a more powerful um, preventive health message than um, than if impacts on life expectancy. If people know that they're going to become dependent and um, experience cognitive decline, um, then that may underpin some of our, our preventive health strategies. Um, but there is a, a wide spectrum of um, frailty indices in middle age, and the frailty index has been validated, as I mentioned, across the life course. So I think it has potential utility for people um, you know, to, to, to understand where they are on in relation to others of the same chronological age, um, so where you are on that spectrum. Yes, thank you. So we have a few questions that have come through and we'll just go through those now. If you are listening and you have questions, um, I'd encourage you to add them to the Q&A box to the right of your screen. And if there are other questions there you like, please like them so that they head to the top. So the first question we have, and as a registered pharmacist, this is one that I am quite interested in myself. From Karen, what are the benefits in relation to patient outcome of measuring frailty? And what are some examples of practical applications for health professionals? Yes, so this is a very important question. And I must admit that the um, field of research in frailty has to date been focusing on measurement rather than what to do about it. Um, but there are more and more studies emerging now that frail older people do benefit from um, multidisciplinary input and rehabilitation. And I think that measuring frailty using a granular approach will give us a more sophisticated understanding about um, what interventions should be applied to older people and what ones shouldn't. So the first thing we need to do, I think, is to communicate frailty status to some of our specialist colleagues um, in relation to the high intensity interventions that we do. So we know, for example, that um, if your frailty index is more than 0.5, um, you will have no benefit at all from having a cardio a, a cardiac bypass graft um, because of the very high risks of um of a uh, cognitive decline and discharge to an institution. So I think that is where we need to start to think what we shouldn't be doing for frail older people and to use frailty measures for that. Um, but there is evidence emerging all the time about the importance of nutrition for frail older inpatients and social engagement and um, early mobilization, for example. So, so there are there there is a you know a, a program of research that we need to establish around um, frailty measures. Um, so generally Aviv, as a pharmacist, you might be interested in some research I did showing that um, polypharmacy in, in frail older people is associated with increased adverse events, whereas um, in people who are more robust, being on more medications isn't necessarily detrimental. So, so those are the patients who benefit from having all the preventive meds and 
this may be why some of the interventions in deprescribing have yielded um, conflicting results. It's because the, the baseline vulnerability and the frailty status of the individual patient at whom the intervention is aimed um, hasn't been adequately teased out. Wonderful, yes, and it, it is always that very challenging polypharmacy, so thank you. Um, this may be a question for you or maybe one that we can take on notice ourselves. Will frailty index be incorporated into DRG classifications or should it be from your perspective? Um, I think it def there would definitely be a role for that. Um, this is work that has to be um, you know, undertaken systematically, um, but frailty is the most important indicator of, of risk status. Um, so we should be adjusting case mix for it, for example. Um, I've lost you, Genevieve, so I'm not sure if I'm still um, being heard, um, but Okay, excellent. Uh, um, yes, yeah, so I think that I think that in the future we will look back and and be astonished that we didn't include those sort of measures in our our case mix, for example. 